I'm Michael, and this is work that I've done with um, Stefan Werner in the, in the Experimental Zoology Group in Wageningen, which is a life sciences and agricultural sciences university in the Netherlands. And what we've been working on for the last while is using neural networks as minimal models for brains. And I'm going to just give a brief argument as well that like this could be useful for consciousness. So we're a, a biophysics group. I was previously here working on sea ice models, so I come from a very much more mathematical background. Um, but we've been doing animal learning experiments and then had some questions that arose from that and then decided to start using neural network models and add in more biology to see what we could learn about possible new phenomenon of emergent behavior from brains and to learn more about how brains work. So I mean the argument here really is that like consciousness arises from tissue and so the aim here is to improve our understanding of tissue and the emergent behaviors of tissue through a biophysics approach, looking at maybe some experiments. But in particular here, I'm going to take a very simple model and then do lots of numerical experiments. It's just the group. So we work on lots of different animal models, animal species, um, experiments on animals, um, lots of modeling, looking for um, detailing detailing and understanding phenomenon and also trying to identify principles. And this work was mostly inspired by this little guy on the bottom right, the planarian that you can chop in half and will regenerate, um, which brings up lots of interesting questions about, okay, like how does it encode things like memory? How does it like, how does its brain work? That sort of thing. So detailed versus minimal models. I mean, so there's lots of different approaches that have been taken to figuring out, okay, how do brains work and how do the various phenomena that occur from this tissue um, present themselves and how can we understand them? You can look at a very detailed model, such as was done here by um, uh, Barabashi about 10 years ago um, on the C. elegans worm, which is the really well understood model species. And you can map out the entire connectomy. And in this case, they did um, network control on the nematode and found out, okay, which neurons can you like burn out and then find our keystone ones because it'll like eliminate behavior. You find out things that are very specific about that particular model organism by doing that kind of very, very detailed work, but it doesn't necessarily scale to other things. In contrast, we could look at a very simple um, system instead that can generalize a bit more broadly. So like the classic case from like climate physics, which I was working in previously, is the Lorenz system versus a GCM. The GCM will tell you things that are specific to certain regions. The Lorenz model will tell you the principles of how the climate works, as in um, sensitivity to initial conditions and so on. And so for this, I'm going to argue that the deep neural net can actually be a good fit. And we see, okay, right, if we add in more biology, when does it behave like an organism and, and when does it not? So in summary, um, Deep learning is becoming a bit more um, accepted as a model for the brain, so the neuroscientists themselves are suggesting this as well. Um, and we're going to see, okay, what can we learn from taking this approach? I'm going to sketch out um, the experiments here in point number two. So in machine learning, we don't tend to do neurogenesis at all. You start from a big net and then train it and then just throw out whatever isn't used, whereas this is not what happens in biology at all. And so I'm going to just sketch some experiments to see, okay, what happens if we treat the neural net more like an organism and actually like introduce neurons? And then I have other work that I won't necessarily cover, um, but people can ask me about afterwards, um, looking at uh, multitask learning, and especially once you introduce sparsity. Um, okay. So neural networks as a model from the brain. As I said, the neuroscientists are slowly starting to introduce this as an idea of a good biological minimal model. And so this was detailed in a paper in 2019 by uh, Blake Richards and Timothy Lillycrap. And what they argue is that, okay, the main thing is that well, the neural network captures three of the very important things that they see in the organism brain as well, which is it has a clear architecture that is somewhat similar. It has a learning rule and it has an objective function. You're trying to optimize something towards a goal. Um, really nice paper if anyone wants to look it up. Um, and so what kind of model are we going to look at? I kind of just um, include this just to kind of motivate which type of neural net I'm, and task I'm going to look at. Is that like, right, so this little guy 
goes around in his environment and he senses lots of things across several different dimensions and then like that all collated together, you could argue makes a kind of a shape, right? And then he makes judgment based on that shape as in like, does he think that there is food nearby or a mate or danger? And so moves towards or away, uh, towards that or away from that. And so you could argue that this is not unlike what we do with a simple computer vision task. We like see something across many different dimensions and then you make a decision based on that, what we think it is. And so for anyone who kind of doesn't know how let's say a deep network works and, and how it's built, we basically put in input data and then we move that data through a series of transformations that we organize in layers. And these transformations are essentially like a weight matrices where you give a linear combination of the previous um, layers data and then apply another transformation to that which we call the activation function. You go to the outside and then uh, uh, right to the, all the way to the right and then that gives you a decision. And then we update those based on telling it whether things are right or wrong according to, oh no. This is a non-spike ReLU. Exactly, yeah, this is just so the activation function I'm going to use here is, is ReLU, which is just this kind of like almost passive propagation, just for simplicity, because I'm taking the simplest possible kind of network that gives me some of the behavior, as much of the behavior as I can get um, from, from the system, right? I'm keeping everything very, very simple. Um, because it's very, if, if I try to like use spiking um, neurons, it's very hard to like make it do something effectively, right? So that's, that's why I'm doing this. Um, I'll rush through this very quickly, but I'm keeping things very simple. I'm using a thing called leaky ReLU um, as an activation function and a cost function, a thing called cross entropy, which people can ask about later. So the kind of experiments that I do is just basically take a simple computer vision task like the MNIST data set, train a neural network in that. I've written everything in Julia so that I know all of the functions that I've used rather than using something like PyTorch, which would obviously be much faster. And then what we expect to see in an experiment is that like it'll train very quickly and then plateau with a lot of noise. I have to make some decisions in experiments in terms of, okay, how many training steps do I have? How fast do I update things, which is the learning rate set by the learning rate eta, um, and also using backprop to train. Um, and I choose an initialization of the weights and biases and initial guess. Um, right, so neurogenesis, again, a thing that the engineers don't really do at all, but the biologists obviously are much more interested in because we see this all around the place in biology. Um, and so this is just a very simple set of experiments that kind of um, justified our prior, which is that we thought that, okay, right, if you're training something and you get towards, towards an optimum, and then you put in a big perturbation, being like throwing lots of new neurons, surely that would destabilize the system. And we recover that in, in some cases. So this is a set of experiments. I'm looking at the cost function, basically a kind of measure of the wrongness. Um, when I'm inserting new neurons in either one big insertion where you get a big destabilization and eventually it plateaus towards what you would expect if you hadn't done anything, um, or like several smaller equally spaced or randomly spaced insertions. So this obviously isn't good and isn't particularly biological because big upsets would surely be not very adaptive. So what we did instead was look at, okay, right, let's think about the biology a bit more clearly. If a neuron is forming, it's going to grow into place. And so start with basically a, a smaller axon, a smaller activation. And so I just, in, when I'm inserting neurons, I initialize them to be from the same distribution, but scaled down massively. And we find that that really smooths out um, the cost function and the accuracy and makes a much smaller perturbation. And we also find that the inserted neurons themselves are incorporated into the model, as in that they actually become important to the solution, as in our, like the output. Um, and so what we really show here is that neurogenesis, this biological thing that the engineers don't really consider at all, can be incorporated in a way that is consistent with the biology and the artificial learning 
even if it mightn't be what the engineers necessarily want for the absolute best performance of a model, because obviously they're paying attention to something very, very different. But we noticed something interesting in this, in that we were getting failures in certain regimes. Um, it was becoming, so we get instabilities just in training this very simple um, neural net, um, where I just have two hidden layers of 20 and 16 neur uh, neurons, and obviously the input and output layers are set by the task, and 10 on the outside, and like 700 odd on the inside for, you know, your MNIST task. Um, and obviously, I mean, the problem here is that the learning rate is too high for the size of the network. But we found that, and especially once you, like, make a larger network, that problem gets worse. So it's fine if we just start at the 2016. If we go up to, let's say, something that has 26 and 22, um, that becomes unstable. But instead, if we, like, do this with a neurogenesis step, as in we train it for a while first and then insert the neurons, we found that that recovers the, the stability. So the next question, of course, with this kind of simulation problem is, <laughs> is this just an artifact? And so we then looked at lots of different learning rates and lots of different initial sizes and found that, first of all, without the neurogenesis, we get this Pareto front of the higher you pump the learning rate and the larger your initial network for this particular task, the more unstable you're going to be. So this is that the success rate starts to decay as you get to a larger network pushed very hard um, with a learning rate. And so then we compared neurogenesis experiments to this kind of either the final or the base. So compared to, let's say, starting with a larger network, initially, the neurogenesis case is more successful, and we see a Pareto front across larger networks with slower um, learning rates down towards even smaller networks with large um, learning rates, basically indicating that we can tolerate a higher learning rate for a larger network if we just build it up slowly in this very simple case. Um, does this do anything for, uh, so this, yeah, does this do anything for the accuracy? We find that like it's slightly more accurate. Obviously the engineers aren't going to be very interested in this, but the biologists might be very interested in this because a larger network might accommodate more tasks and differentiation, which an organism is going to want to do. Um, then this is another case of, okay, right, we add in eight neurons, four to each layer, and we get a similar sort of, oh no, this is, yeah. So this is compared to the initial size. Uh, it is mildly more accurate, it doesn't really matter, and it is mildly more stable. So really that the effect is when we compare to starting with a larger network and as we get really up towards, you know, a more unstable regime. And then, let's say, looking at a bigger perturbation, 16 neurons instead of 8, we get an even larger effect whereby uh, you can tol tolerate even much larger later sizes of the final network um, and that the neurogenesis case will be much, much more stable um, and then a bit more accurate. Right, so we've identified a phenomenon that we think that these simulations, because obviously simulations won't be perfect for the real biology, they think that the simulations might actually indicate that neurogenesis can stabilize learning. We might wish to initially test this phenomenon in reality. And what we can do um, to do this is look at a system like DishBrain. So DishBrain was a set of experiments that was uh, in the media about a year ago, whereby they ta taught uh, an array in a petri dish of real neurons how to play Pong. And from this, of course, you can measure things like um, how they enlarge, which would be a, a, um, in the axon or in the neuron, and how much more they're going to fire. So we could try and actually test the entire um, set of theories that we've, that we've shown here. Um, okay, very quickly sketch the last few bits because I actually have plenty of time. Um, so just in summary, um, deep learning has been more accepted for a model of the brain. 
animals grow new neurons, models of brains don't. What if they did? Just from some very simple experiments, we show that, right, the models can actually perform pretty okay um, with biologically in, um, inspired neurogenesis and that it can be beneficial. And that also it's possible from these experiments that neurogenesis can stabilize higher learning rates. And the important thing here for, let's say, an approach, a mathematical approach to consciousness is that looking at both the biology and a minimal model that we can analyze in detail, we can come up with new possible testable phenomena. I'll very quickly sketch through some other work that I did um, on dual task learning. So in this case, we're going to overload a network on both the MNIST task and the fashion MNIST task, which is basically just 10 classes of clothing items compared to 10 handwritten digits. Um, we find that alternating the results um, can mitigate the kind of forgetting that happens when you try and overload a network to teach, um, teach several different tasks, which in the machine learning parlance apparently is called relaying, which I found out this morning. So already I've had some very useful discussions with people. Um, and so yeah, very, very simple. Um, the biology can agree somewhat with the, um, the machine learning. The interesting thing to look at though is, right, what does it actually look like in the network when you try and do this? And so we then took one of these networks that we've alternated training for for a while and essentially uh, performs okay on both tasks on to see, okay, like what is the most important node for each task and are they different? Are we getting some specialization? This is based on some work by David Bao. Um, and what we find is that if we use network dissection, so basically what these plots show here is, okay, like I look at the two tasks and start ablating neurons and see which um, neurons cause the greatest decrease in accuracy for a given task, and then rank those neurons by the decrease in accuracy. And then I look for the level of overlap between the importance of nodes for the two different tasks we find basically that we get specialization, um, whereby these curves here lie up closer to one rather than the random case, which is the curved line being a hypergeometric distribution. Um, I also looked at sparsity a little bit and we re recover very similar kinds of behavior for that, but I will wrap it up instead. Um, and people can ask me about that later. So in terms of outlook and next step and conclusions, um, basically to con the outlook would be to continue with more biology and see what we can learn from these very simple models. Um, and the impact would be that like, right, work on real learning in simple brains reveals some emergent ph phenomena and principles that we could test. And that eventually if we do enough of that, we might be able to converge on an understanding of um, consciousness from the biological point of view, as well as all of the other directions that we're discussing at the conference. And with that, I'll wrap up.